about why you pray, which leads to intimacy with Jesus and others. These things are connected. And then coming back up to that concept of an identity and holy order and going through gender roles, women in the world and church, submission and spiritual leadership. And um, that may be as far as we make it tonight. Uh, those are loaded. Those are loaded. And so I want to give you um, two teachings that you must listen to. You must listen to these two teachings. And I haven't bought the book yet, but I'm going to when we get paid. Uh, the name of the teachings are called The Theology of Empowering Women. Chelsea, are you ready for me to start? Okay. The Theology of Empowering Women by Chris, spelled with a K, K-R-I-S, Valotun, B A L L O T O N. Chris with a K, K R I S, Valotun, B A L L O T O N. The Theology of Empowering Women, Part 1 and Part 2. And um, uh, they're free on iTunes, they're podcasts. You can watch them free or listen to them free. And um, I am not going to teach what he taught because he did a great job teaching. But I'm going to grab a couple of nuggets from that because I know that you guys have got questions just like I did for years and years and years. Well, what about, what about that? And so I'm going to answer those questions, but if you want a more thorough teaching on that, I'm going to send you to the person who's done extensive research on it. Because what I have is pieces that the Lord has given me. But as he said, he, he has 400 hours of research. Wow. 400 hours of research on the beauty, intention, equality, purpose, design of a woman. And so the name of the book that he has written is called uh, Fashioned to Reign, is the name of his book that, that incorporates um, all the research that he did. Amazing. So I want to um, start out with this odd little story and tell you why it matters so much that we understand this topic through and through. Um, I had someone who stopped me um, in a parking lot. Hey, hey, I've been reading your blogs, and I know you're concerned about world affairs and what we're going to do about it. And I just wanted to let you know that um, uh, at our church, the pastors are calling all the local pastors to come together to pray. And I said, that's fantastic. So I'm sitting here all excited, right? In my heart, I'm all excited. Going, she stopped me. She's telling me about, I'm so excited, right? And so she goes, and I thought you could help spread the word. And I'm, I'm thinking, yeah, I'm going to buy her, I'm going to buy her, I'm going to buy her. I want to make sure, my, oh, I think I'm going to be out of town, but I can tell my friends. Mm -hmm. And she goes, yeah, because uh, they came, the pastors, they came to our Bible studies. She's in a powerhouse, powerhouse Bible studies. I mean, like, generals, generals in the kingdom, women, in this Bible study, right? They came to that Bible study to announce this prayer gathering of the pastors. You know what they asked them to do? Make snacks. Yeah. And she said that I went, oh, like I'm not being invited to that. Those women aren't being invited to that. We're supposed to be the promoters and make snacks. And I thought, do you get it? That is a perfect picture of what's wrong with the church today. It's as if there's no room for us at the table. But that's not the table that the Lord has set. That's the table that the traditions of man has set. And so we must know why that matters. And I feel like I'm so concerned for us as women that we have gotten so distracted, we have forgotten we're in the middle of a war zone. And so we abdicate our position as a soldier because we're all playing in the dust and the mud puddles and something else. And I'm going to show you pictures of what I mean by this ultimate distraction. Um, <clears throat> and who 
was it? I think it was you. Were you the one that was talking about um, the government sponsored reconstructive surgeries? Was he in Brazil? It was Brazil. Mm -hmm. So he, uh, Chris Valentin, tells um, he has a he has dreams, a revelation about dreams um, on a frequent basis. And they were going to a Latin American country, and it made me connect the dot about what you said. And I want to relay this story to you. And see if you, let's like collectively, I'm going to see if you have the reaction that I had. He said he had a dream, and he was quite at length, and I'm not going to do that. But that the women were all, they were in rooms, and they were tattered and bound up, and just gagged and just downtrodden. And church bells in the villages, church bells started ringing. And so the women pulled themselves up. And as the women, I just, I've got like, I'm just like electrified to see them speaking this out loud. The church bells started ringing, and as the women drug themselves to their feet and they started walking toward the church bells, the tatters and the chains start to start falling off from them. Because I believe that's exactly what happens. As you come toward Jesus, you know more and more who you are, and all that stuff just comes falling off. So I'm going, yes, go Jesus, go Jesus, because I'm listening to this story. And so then he talks about the next scene of the dream was there was a man um, sitting on like a place of authority. He was calling it a throne, but it wasn't like a throne over a kingdom, but like a place of authority. And there was another chair right beside him, but that chair was empty and was dusty, as if it had not been sat in for quite some time. And he had a scepter in his hand. And so in his vision, um, a woman came, and he saw a woman coming, and he got up and he dusted off this seat to try to make preparation for her. And she sat down and he gave her a scepter. And then God, heaven opened up and gave him another scepter. So they both had scepters, both sitting in places of authority. Right? Just makes my heart swell. I believe that's exactly what Jesus did for us. I absolutely believe that. So um, let me tell you the reaction. This pastor went and told these top leaders in this country that vision, he said, they were outraged. He said, do not breathe a word of this to anyone at this conference. Do not breathe a word of it. And to this day, that, that revelation from God has been shut down. Because they said, women have their place, and we're not about to buck it. So you understand the implications of that? So the other side of the dream, when we complete the dream, and he said that while this was going on, after this position here, that he saw that the, there was a demonic spirit that if the men refused this picture to come to fullness, God had a plan of fullness, full authority, full kingdom sharing. That was God's plan. And that if the man refused to make way for her to have her proper place, that there was a demonic spirit that would cause a feminist movement like the world had never seen before. And it was going to tear the country apart. Because... Women would only go so far. If you will not give me my rightful place, then I will fight for it and I'll take it. And then that's still not a rightful place. Do you understand what I'm saying? And when he said that, it made me think about the, the war on, and we're talking about that part of the country, that part of the world, but it's, it's all right here, right? All that we're talking about lives right here in this country. But I heard that about the demonic force of causing women to rise up. And I immediately thought of, the story that we heard two weeks ago about a woman, um, an average of five plastic surgeries, reconstructive beauty improving surgeries provided by the government, that at some point a woman is going to get sick of tormenting and torturing herself trying to live up to a man's idea. Are you connecting the dots? I'm not doing very good in English, but can you hear what I'm saying? So I see that 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 demonic plan is already in force because she's trying, trying, trying. Whatever you want me to be, I'll try to be it. And she's going to go, enough! And it's not going to be under the headship of Jesus. It's going to be under this complete, total hostility. And she's still not going to be walking in the trueness of Christ. So the reason these conversations matter is because I believe every time we speak out the truths of Jesus... We think we're in a room. I think we speak out over eternity. I think we speak out over the truth, the truth of God that's always been in his heart, and we further that down the river. And it's so critically important that we do what we do and why we do it. 
So you got to own this stuff. Some of you are going, I never heard this my whole life. Great, now you've begun. Don't stop. Don't let anybody steal from you the manna and the bread that God has already given you. Don't let anybody steal from you the identity and the revelation that you've gotten a whiff of something because it's very easy to come back in a structure and a culture that goes, get in place. Get in place. Get in place. And you have a place, and it's right beside Jesus. And so it's okay for you to go, uh, this does not sound like Jesus. I found, can I tell you, in, in arguing conversations with men, they could never refute that one. They could tell me that I don't know Greek and I don't know Hebrew and that I'm mistaking the Bible. And I know that I'm going, I got, agree with every bit that you just said. It does not sound like Jesus. It does not sound like the redemptive work of the cross. And so that's part of what we're bearing. I don't know if anybody saw the prayer that I posted on Facebook this late this afternoon. But um, Chris Valentin prayed for all the women in the listening and just the power of his prayer, even though it was recorded, was that we wouldn't try to be a man or lead like a man or do anything like a man because we're not men, but that we would be mothers and matriarchs and queens and that we would rise up and be what God meant for us to be, fully, fully full of the Holy Spirit, fully full of the love of God and his image and move forward in that way and that the men desperately needed us to take our place. And then he asked, forgive us, Lord, for the generations of sin against women for 2,000 years, sinning against them. And so I want to give you um, two points. You know the scripture in 2 Corinthians? There's also a passage in Titus, I mean Timothy in a passage in um, Ephesians that talks about that women should be silent. Do you know these scriptures? And he laughed about that. And he said... Women, we don't even need to talk about where that is in the Bible because you've had that crammed down your throat so many times. You know perfectly well where it is. It's like it's all over the place. But he said something. that This is the first time I've ever come across this, and I'm embarrassed. I'm embarrassed for us as student, students of the Bible that we didn't know this already. He was talking about in the, New, in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, everything is hung on the skeleton of the Old Testament is hung on Mosaic Law. Agree? Leviticus, Mosaic Law. The four books, first five books of the Bible, I mean, Mosaic Law. Everything is hung on that. And so we move and we do that. So in the Old Testament, you have um, queens, you have priestesses, you have prophets, you have dreams, you have, do you understand? You have all kinds of leadership. You have all kinds of giftings in the Old Testament. And um, the Old Testament is not nice to women, right? The social standing under the curse in the, in the land of Hebrews and Israel and that whole culture, women were viewed as property. No questions asked. They didn't own anything. They themselves were property. They could have been traded. They could be discarded. It's a bad deal. It's not a good place. It's not a good place at all. But then you have the New Testament, and in the New Testament, I just was blown away by this. You have between Malachi and Matthew, you have 400 years. The last book of the Old Testament, first book of the New Testament, 400 years. And so you have this, this gap. And so what happened in that 400-year gap is a new religion was born, which was Judaism. And they took approximately 200 laws that was given in the Old Testament under Mosaic Law, and they stretched them out to over 630 laws. A hundred of those laws that were added were meant to oppress women. I would like to point out to you, women were already oppressed. Do you understand? So we just wrote a hundred more laws to oppress women even further. So when Jesus comes on the scene, he's addressing three groups of people. The Jews, who knew the Mosaic Law. The Romans, who had their own law. And then the Greeks. Where has this been my whole life? I loved it. I was so grateful to the Lord and my husband who pointed me to the direction of the thing. See, that team effort. Go heirs. Love it. Um, the Jews, when Jesus is talking to the Jews, he knows the law forward and backwards, right? And the Jewish men also know the law because, remember, all boys are taught the first five books of the Bible. I mean, this is standard procedure. The Romans have their own sense about women. They're a little bit better than the way the Jews treat the women, but they still have no place. 
They still have no voice. They don't own anything. Still bad. But the Greeks, on the other hand, the Greeks, their primary deity were goddesses. So they worshipped women. You have Diana, Artemis. Do you remember all these Greek mythology? They're Greek. They worshipped women. And I'm going to try to connect these dots. Bear with me. I haven't tried to do this publicly before. But man, all my gerbils were having like a conference this afternoon. I was going crazy. Because the Lord, for about three months, the Lord has been just, I keep hearing this phrase, the objectification of women. The objectification of women. What does that mean? I don't know what that means. The objectification of women. Okay, okay. And then this video comes in and that book comes in. The objectification of women. The problem is women are viewed as objects. Women are viewed as objects. Okay, Lord. Okay, I'm listening. I'm listening. What does this mean? Okay? Gets me so fired up and I'm going, I'm listening. Tell me what it is you're trying to say. So then I'm looking at, here's this whole process of how the writers of the New Testament are addressing the Jews, the Romans, or the Greeks. And so there are 30, there are 40 authors of the New Testament. There's only, listen, this is data, but I want you to have it. And you're going to get this again when you go back and listen. There are 40 authors of the New Testament. There's only one author that says anything restrictive about women. Only one. So 39 authors going, go, go, go. One author that's going, hold up. And what you've got to know is that the books, the epistles in the New Testament are addressing nine regions in the world. Only three of those regions are being corrected. The rest of them, go, go, go. And so we have three regions, and they are Ephesus, Crete, and Corinth. And in those three cities is idol worship of women, the goddesses, the statues, Diana, and all these, are, the names are escaping me. Do you know the Greek goddesses, Artemis, and Artemis is the goddess of wisdom, though. No, Artemis would be Ephesus, uh, like the goddess of the heart. The fertility, right? Uh -huh. You know, there's the multi-breasted goddess, and they would go up and they would do this stuff. So listen to me here. When I read in the Bible, and he says, when you read in the Bible and they talk about the temple prostitutes, he goes, you're thinking about a prostitute that's gross and seedy, like you see on television or on the street. He goes, this is the best of the best of the best of a woman. Because they worshipped women because they wanted what women had. Okay, I want sex so bad, and women hold the key to whether or not I get to have sex. Are you tracking with me? So they're going, women have all this power because women dictate whether or not I get to have sex or not. So when you had sex with a temple prostitute, listen to this. They viewed it in that culture as if you were getting an anointing, a, like a spiritual anointing, because you're having the sex act with a temple prostitute, like you're blending this, this mythical kind of spirituality and sexuality at the same time. Are you all getting this? The objectification of women. The temple prostitutes do this whole blurred line of spirituality about what's holy, what's not. They pull all these things together and they reduce it to this level of a woman's body parts. It doesn't ever talk about a spiritual prostitute expanding <coughs> emotion, intellect, advancing. Do you understand? Her purpose, her function was to have sex with whomever she deemed. So if you're there in the temple and I come over and I go, I'm going to pick you today. Woohoo! Happy day for me. And so there's like all this grasping after this. Oh, it's cra Do you see how crazy this is now? Can you see why the Lord is going, stop it. Stop it right now. Stop it right now. Because it's reducing the woman and the man to something so much lower than what God ever designed or hoped for them to be. So, those, those books, Corinthians, Timothy, and I just forgot the other one. Ephesians. Ephesians. When it talks about correcting women, about what they can speak and what they can't speak, all of those are addressing women and men, both men and women, in that city who are Greeks. They have no concept of Judaic law. They have no concept of anything. And they're going, you got total chaos. We got to balance the scale. 
where the Romans and the Jews, they think women are trash, and, and Jesus is going, let's elevate these women back up where they go. In those three cities, women are God. Literally, they are the gods. And so Paul's going, calm back down. Everybody calm back down. Let's get this balanced this way. The women need to come down, and the men need to come up, because in that city, women were overpoweringly dominant. They drove the bus in every area. Men completely abdicated their total person, their total function. It's kind of like reverse roles. Y'all tracking with me? Are your wheels turning or are you falling asleep? Are y'all with me? No, I'm awesome. Okay, this matters because, as Chris Dalton says, we took those three verses out of those three books, we threw away the rest of the Bible and created doctrines to try to keep women in their place. And I would like to suggest to you, I would just like to suggest to you, as quietly like we talked about being too intense, let me take these right before I say this. It's still coming. <laughs> it is as bad as it is because we laid down. It's as bad as it is because we laid down our responsibility to walk in the fullness of God. I've heard so many people go, well, I didn't know that much about Jesus. When I was a parent, I'm going, well, you had the same Bible I got. Had the same Bible, long time. Just because you don't know the Word, just because you don't know what's offered, doesn't excuse you from walking in it. It's your job, study to show yourself approved. Step up, stand up. <clears throat> Figure out what you're doing and why you're doing it. And listen, just because some guy tells you, can I tell you how many people... Can you believe in my own church? I got saved in this church. I was um, leading a worship song. I wasn't even leading worship, God forbid. I was going to do a solo and invite people in to sing because that's not leading worship. That's just doing the solo. And I was going to read the song that the song was taken from, and I had a deacon from that church come up and tell me I could not read that song because women were not supposed to speak in public. Now, I just want to tell you, I think it's the mercy of God that there was not blood on the floor, particularly, I was a pretty new believer at that point, and Chuck was very kind also, so I took that as a win, I took that as a win, but do you hear the absurdity of that? Do you hear the absurdity of that? Now, here's the problem. I bet I went to, I bet I went to probably ten people. This just happened. Show me that in the Bible. I, I don't, what, what is this? Well, that's crazy. And you know that I only had one person out of ten that went, that's crazy. That should never happen. And everybody else went, well, you know, well, you know. And I thought, I'm going to figure this out. I'm going to learn from the Lord. I'm going to be a student of the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to let him tell me what the truth is. And once he tells me what the truth is, nobody's going to talk me out of it again. And I'd like to challenge you to do the same. Because I tell you, now that i got an answer for this, women should be silent in church, ain't, ain't oh, God forbid, somebody bring that up on my face. You know what I mean? Because I am so ready. I'm like so ready. And I have been, I want you to hear me say, I've been seeking, like all of these women issues about women being silent, women having authority, women in the headship and husbands and wives and all that kind of stuff, all those issues. And it's an ongoing journey with the Lord. He brings you revelation. When the student is ready, the teacher will appear. So are you being a good student? If you're married, you need to know this stuff. If you're planning on getting married, you need to know this stuff. If you're planning on having any power whatsoever for the remainder of your life, you need to know this stuff. Because you have a world system in the church and out of the church that's constantly trying to diminish you and reduce you. Are you sick of it yet? So there's the gauntlet. I can't say it any nicer. I just can't say it any nicer. Because there is a responsibility to us. And I want to show you a couple of things to show, to stir your passion about why this matters. And I have a scripture I wanted to give you. Let me give you the medicine first, and then I'll give you the windy. So let's do um, 2 Corinthians um, 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Uh, 
Oh, I could just about read the whole chapter, but let's start at um, 11. Since then, so you're in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, verse 11. Since then, we know what it is to fear the Lord. We try to persuade men. What we are is plain to God, and I hope it is also plain to your conscience. We are not trying to commend ourselves to you again, but are giving you an opportunity to take pride in us so that you can answer those who take pride in what is seen rather than what is in the heart. If we are out of our mind, it is for the sake of God. If we are in our right mind, it's for you. For Christ's love compels us, because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who should live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and raised again. So here's the next part, right here. So, from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regard, regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us this ministry of reconciliation. What's the ministry of reconciliation? That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. It just goes on. It just goes on. It's beautiful. Then look at, um, so that's one thing. What I want you to see is, so I want you to grab the phrase, we no longer regard someone, uh, sorry, we once, let me find the phrase, from now on, we no longer regard, um, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. And if you look at that in different translations, we used to view you, we used to, we used to live according to the flesh, we used to view others according to the flesh, but we don't do that anymore. We don't do that anymore because we're not in the flesh anymore. We're in the spirit. If you go just put that verse in, 2 Corinthians 5, like 12, 13, 14, and just look at the different translations, you're going to see them break that verse down. Oh, I used to think like this because I was part of the world, but now God has plucked me out of the world, and now I'm in God. So when I look at people, when I think about people, it's from God's perspective and not from a world perspective. So I tell you that because I believe women are women's worst enemies. I used to believe that men were women's worst enemies. And I, the more I sit in this issue, this objectification of women with the Lord, bear with me. This is going to need some, you need a tank on your back for this. I believe that what needs to happen is a change, a revolution, beginning within a woman's heart for a woman's heart. And then I believe that the men will follow suit. Yes. But we've abandoned our place in the way that we love other women. And I'm going to show you some pictures of that. And then the other verse I wanted to give you was Philippians 2. If you'll flip forward to that, Philippians 2. Like I said, give you the medicine. We'll break this down a little bit more. chapter 2, verse 12. Therefore, dear friends, as you have always been obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. Do everything without complaining or arguing, so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the word of life, in order that I may boast on the day of Christ and that I did not run or labor for nothing. That's your charge. Your charge. Your charge is not to look just like a crooked and depraved generation. Your charge is to shine like stars. Now, for you recovering legalists, I'm not talking about trying to please God. You already please God. I'm talking about shining like stars because you come to know the truth. Listen, the more you get to the light, the more you reflect the light. Amen? The closer you get to the sun. Let me give you this beautiful picture. I was going to bring this at another time. But we got to watch uh, our, the location of our condo at this retreat. You can see the sunrise perfectly. And so it's pitch black, and then you see color, and you sort of start to see the divide. Okay? 
This is like a picture of coming into Jesus. First, everything's dark. You can't discern and separate anything. But as the light of Christ starts dawning in you, all of a sudden, if you keep looking, oh, there's a horizon. Yeah, there's the earth and there's the ocean. I start discerning and seeing things differently than I used to. Are you with me? And then there's this odd thing because the sun is starting to come up. And as you're looking at these clouds, the clouds are black. And the sun's not yet up. It's not come up across the horizon. But they are black, black, black clouds. And so when you're first into salvation, when you're first or new or even possibly immature in Christ, all you're thinking about are those black clouds. Oh, I got this. Oh, I got this. Oh, I'm struggling with this. Oh, I'm working on this. You're still talking about the clouds. But see, here's the problem. It's not about the clouds. It's about the sun that is continually, perpetually, unstoppably rising in a person's life. And you know what happened? As the sun continued to come up, those clouds went from pitch black to blood red to pure white to gone. Amen. That is the process of sanctification. Amen? That you go from dark, dark, cannot see a thing. And then you start seeing a distinction. And then everything that was once black in you is covered by the blood of Christ and then washed white as snow, and then suddenly it's gone. And the only thing we see is the brilliance of the rising sun. That's your charge. We don't need to talk about all this other stuff. Let's talk about the rising sun of God rising up in your life so that you shine like stars in this dark and depraved generation. I just want to go run around the building and like, hallelujah. Do you have a hallelujah? It's amazing. That God is that good, that powerful, that transforming. But you've got to know what you're fighting for. You've got to know why you're fighting and why it matters so much. Whew! Amen. <laughs> so, can you help me play these stuff? I'm thinking it's going to crunch really bad. Here's a chord. How much did I I did a retreat with that truck and I said, I'll never ever do it again. It was awful. I don't even get all the text there. Objectification is confused with thinking that a woman's hot. Objectification 
orientation is not the same as being sexual or being sexually attracted to someone. That's a natural part of life, right? But what's not natural and is very much manufactured is constantly portraying women as sex objects for male pleasure. Objectification is women's magazines being littered with all the things that men don't like. Objectification is being catcalled and harassed just for walking down the street. It's save the movies and don't like cancer steal second base as breast cancer campaign slogans. It's shitty commercial after shitty commercial using women's bodies to sell everything from A to Z. Close-ups on her ass, her lips, her breasts to sell beer? Cologne? Jeans? Jewelry? Sometimes it's hard to tell what they're even selling. Objectification is a preoccupation with trans women's genitals and defining her in terms of her sex parts. Being bombarded with sexy cleavage in every magazine ever while being told that breastfeeding is obscene. School dress codes for girls that are designed not to distract boys because her knees, her shoulders are so sexualized that a tank top is deemed inappropriate. Objectification is the thousands of comments on my YouTube videos where men talk about my breasts, my body, and leave graphic sexual comments about me. It's a flood of movies and TV shows where men of all different body types date women of one body type. It's women's bodies used as sexy background accessories in music videos. Objectification is the idea that men and women simply cannot be friends because men could never see a woman as anything but sexual. It's regular Halloween costumes for boys and sexed up versions, only sexed up versions, for girls. It's one of the things you don't plan seeing women as sex objects because part of our cultural subconscious. We do it and we live in it and we aren't even aware of how bizarre it actually is. In a sane world, one that we do not live in, everyone will be mostly subjects and occasionally objects. Now this is actually the status quo for men right now. This is not the status quo for women. 96% of sexually objectifying imagery is of women's bodies. This pattern reveals one hell of a message about gender, that men are mostly sexual subjects and women are mostly sexual objects. That inequality is the reason why this picture looks commonplace, while this picture looks kind of awkward. <laughs> In this kind of culture, men are granted more sexual power than women, which leads us to see the world through men's eyes. We learn that male sexuality is active, that they're visual creatures, and that the objectification of women in their life, using women for sex, is both normal and praiseworthy. Hell, it might even be funny and charming. Secondly, we don't require that men look a particular way to be taken seriously. The cultural narrative looks at men as whole people, which leads to mostly men's stories being told, 80% of political offices being occupied by men, men occupying the highest ranks in virtually every industry in the world. Thirdly, because women's bodies are subject to constant frivolous criticism, girls learn quickly to self-objectify. The APA reports that self-objectification results in lower cognitive and motor functioning, increased sexual dysfunction, and body shame. It found that self-objectification is directly related to girls pursuing fewer careers in STEM fields. It's also a major contributor to mental health issues like eating disorders and depression, which disproportionately affect young women. And to go all the way into the shadows, sexual objectification contributes to a culture where sexual violence isn't taken seriously. It tells us that male power over women is normal and sexual equality is something that most people don't even understand. That men are sexually aggressive while women are sexually submissive. That men should want and women should want to be wanted by men. You know, she should take that harassment as a compliment. She asked for it. He can't help himself. He can't be raped. We all deserve better because this, this is some bullshit. Everyone should be pissed that this is so normal. Are you pissed? I'm pissed. Let's change it. First step, gotta be aware of it. Then cue the micro changes. This is pretty simple to do, actually. Stop valuing women on how they look and treating them like sex objects. Treat women like people. You already do that. Yay! Then it's time to speak up when you see companies and media doing this. Let them know it's not okay. Support people who are speaking out and become a giant cycle of change that is unstoppable. If you made it this far, you have officially made it through my longest video on YouTube. Gold star! I'm going to be speaking at a bunch of schools. Check it out in the description. Also, tons of links and thingy. How about that? Give me some.
some thoughts and feedback. Come on. Do you agree? Do you disagree? Have you ever thought about it? Does this catch you by surprise? It's not a surprise. That picture of the woman on the counter with no clothes on and then the replacement of the man on the counter. <laughs> the, it makes you, you're like, mm, that's not right. Because it's shoved down our throats every single day. It makes you want to vomit. I want to zero in on the thought of this thought. Um, uh, I want you just to consider this. This is like, whoo, I just, I hope I have deodorant on, okay? I want you to think about, at weddings, she talked about this, in movies, in Hollywood, in our life, in real world life, you see men with all kinds of body styles, all kinds of body styles, and they even write funny stories about what's that gorilla, what's that crazy song you used to sing all the time, drove me crazy, like, all the time, like, the gorilla's walking down the street, Yeah. what's the, what's the line of the song? Um, Pretty women out walking with gorillas down my street. Uh, Joe Jackson. Right. And, uh, and so, like, a guy, we don't ever, we don't even think about a guy's Is value. Is she really going out with him? Is she really going out with him? But then there's, like, this pressure and quota, quota, idea, perfectionism kind of style about what a woman is supposed to look like. And so a guy can look like anything he wants. But a woman has this ideal about what she's supposed to look like. And if she doesn't, then there's something wrong with her. And that self-objectification, so you have the objectification of women, let's hit that just for a second, is about how we evaluate another woman's beauty in split seconds as we look at her. Say law, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand because I've not met a woman yet that doesn't do it. And we constantly measure ourselves based on how we're doing, right? Even so much so, like, the way I have gone through my, I'll, I'll take you all off the heat and I'll just use myself as a, as a pin cushion. My own level of self-loathing and what I'm worthy of doing based on my weight. I shouldn't do videos because, I shouldn't be on the worship team because the way I have disvalued and discounted myself because of my weight. And if you've got an amen in there, just note it, note it, mm -hmm. and, and or maybe you're on the other side, I only, I get to do this because I, and I put in all the hard work so I get the perks. Also been in that field where you don't get tickets from police officers because you still got the look. Anybody got that shit out of there? That's a crazy thing because you've got something or you've shown something or you've offered. You've offered not inside, you offered outside to appease some un, un, unnamed, unknown God that's trying to keep a woman in a compartmentalization. So there's like this objectification and I'd like to collectively, if I had to start a revolution, it would be that we stop valuing ourselves as objects and we stop evaluating our sisters as objects. I was at a, a retreat today, only 15 women. No, she didn't come. 14 women. Only 14 women. You should have seen the insecurities pinging around the room. It was hilarious. I'm going, we're all here for Jesus. We all love each other, even if we don't know each other. We're so weird. We're so diverse. You could not have had a more diverse group of people in one little, you know, condo. But I just thought, we're so desperately not okay with who we are. And so because we're not okay with who we are, then I should I be like you? Should you be like me? And it's just like, oh, I'm going to just stop it. Just stop it. Because if, I, if I'm only looking at you based on what you look like on the outside, I miss like 98% of you. Did you hear what I just said? That's straight from heaven. Your body only represents like 2% of you. Do you get it? That's why we grieve when somebody loses their mind, because we lost them. We don't go, oh, they lost their body, because there's plenty of people who've lost their bodies, yet they went on. They continued on, right? It's like you, you and I coming to an understanding of what it means for women to walk in the fullness of Christ in the Spirit so that the way we view our bodies is different, and the way we view each other's bodies. Now, 
You got all kinds of corn crap. You got, every time I go to the store, I just want to vomit, okay? All that crap going on on us all the time. And so you can either put your head in the sand or you can rise up and go, yep, not playing. And I tell you, I've worked, I've worked with wives of porn a long time now. And most women go, just what boys do. And I just want to say, no, hell no, hell no, hell no, hell no. And God has a bigger plan for you, and he has a bigger plan for your husband. And it's, listen, I saw a picture. I don't know if I'm going to show you this. I don't even know what time it is. I saw a picture today, but it said there was a picture of a woman is in the bed, and a man is on top of her, right? And the woman has a magazine of her face. And it says, The Ultimate Temptation. And I thought, look at the distortion. Can you visualize that picture? Just try to pull that picture up in your mind. The ultimate distortion of the man and the woman in the garden. He's gone, gotten off about somebody that's not even there. She's gone because she's hiding behind this fake notion of a woman. They're both gone. Do you understand what I'm saying? They both have lost their minds and their hearts because of this pressure of trying to live up to something that doesn't even exist. So I would like to suggest that God is raising up women like never before and empowering them like never before and giving them an opportunity to speak and use their voice for the first time, I believe, in history that we are rescuing men instead of being, oh, save me, help me. In the 50s, this would never happen. Do you understand? Because everybody had to have a man. And everybody had to have somebody come and rescue them. And for the first time, women have gotten a little bit of breath of independence. And they're getting a clarity about who Jesus is for the first time in some deeper ways. That they're going, oh, 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 I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You must have confused me with somebody else. Because I'm the bride of Christ. And we're not going to settle for this anymore. That's what changes generations. Do you understand what I'm saying? But I want to continue to come back and hit this and challenge you. If you're self-objectifying yourself... If you discount yourself because of the size of your breasts, large or small, can y'all just get pissed off about that for like five minutes? It's ridiculous. <coughs> You're going to reduce this whole room full of awesomeness to the size of breasts? Are you kidding me? It just, it just makes my head pop. All my gerbils are screaming. They're jumping up down. It's crazy. But I think we do it to ourselves. I think we're doing it to each other. And if we stand up and go, uh, that would only be a very small part, and we start speaking with authority, standing in authority, loving in authority of Christ, I think our whole world's going to shift and change. And I want to give this to you one connection. Why does objectification matter? Where do you think sex trafficking came from? Sex trafficking came from millions of silent women. I have never my whole life even remotely considered that, but this summer the Lord just laid that on my mind. We wanted the men to go fix the men. And I'm going, no, it's the women who are not standing up and rescuing and praying for the women and going, we're not going to take this anymore. Just hallelujah, amen. Okay, let's do something remotely comical just to for me. This other one's just too intense. I'll show you later. Chuck, where's my little funny thing? Oh, here it is. Yeah, yeah, I got it. Sorry, friends. This is cold. What do we live in a world where women can't call men? Yeah, I do that. I know. Oh, hey! You look like you love commitment. Oh, boy. Hey, what you got under that shirt, sweetie? That's a good heart. Get those arms to put together my IKEA furniture. <laughs> okay, sweetie, you want a family? Hey, baby. Hey, baby. I bet you'd let me choose what to do with my own body. Oh, your food looks so good on my couch. You want to Like a real mess. Let me fix you. Yeah, baby, I bet you have a job of 
chapter over and over and over. Everything that you're longing for is found there. So, submission for me in my marriage, but also in my biblical doctrine, is a non-issue because I think it's yet another one of those sticks that men have tried to keep women in their place, but it has to land at the cross. <coughs> it's for freedom that you've been set free. Oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Why would you yet again be yoked again to slavery? Galatians 5.1. I'm not going to go back under slavery when Jesus set me free. So, let that just percolate. Okay, let me pray for you. Jesus, I just want to say thank you. I'm not really sure that I've just ever said thank you for setting me free in this particular way and setting women free, God, even how... I was so refreshed today to um, hear even the whole thing about the 12 disciples. You, know, you just answered so many questions for me today, Lord, and I just, I'm so grateful for being um, Holy Spirit truly such an awesome teacher. So teach these women and teach their women friends and moms and sisters and daughters and just this ripple effect to go out from your heart, God, that you're going, there's more, there's so much more, so much more. And we have um, so much gifting to pour out on this world, this dark and depraved world. We just want to shine like you more and more. God, I just thank you. I bless you. I thank you. Um, I'm just so blown away by your kindness. And, um, yeah, thank you, Jesus. Amen. The Lord has brought this back to mind, so let me bring this to you. I remember being sitting in a church service, and uh, this pastor said, yeah, there's a lot of confusion about the men and the women thing. But I just wanted to tell you that there were 12 disciples, and they were men for a reason. And that was when Chuck leaned over and grabbed my hand. <laughs> Stay in your chair. Stay in your chair. Stay in your chair. Stay in your chair. Because I was like so incensed by that. And so today, and that, that comment has just haunted me because I know that those men were handpicked by God. But I'm so tired of being, acting like I want, I'm, not, I'm not allowed to be with Jesus because he picked 12 disciples. And then just the revelation of this today was women were still yet property. Jesus had not died on the cross yet. Mm -hmm. Women had not yet been properly restored. And so nobody would even listen to them. And God is planting the gospel and he's trying to get the gospel out. And until Jesus is risen from the grave, risen from the dead, there's a transaction that has to happen so that they have received their voice. That's why it's so critically important. Remember last time I told you who was at the empty tomb? A woman. Now listen, all those women, and, and I will say the woman at the well, she was speaking pre, pre-resurrection. She was speaking, right? She was sharing her story and teaching, right? But... This was so beautiful. I've heard about that before. Men who talk about men being all that in the mind of Jesus. Where were the men at the tomb? Everybody knew. Jesus had told everybody. Men and women. I'm going to die. I'm going to be crucified. Three days in the grave. Coming back. All of them knew that. Well, where were the men? The men were all hiding out. And it was a woman that came who had the faith to believe. And I believe that it was that one act. Do you remember women? had no voice, and they could not even be a witness in a court of law. So now here is a woman that God's going, here you go, girl. It's all yours. I'm giving you all the power of Christ in this moment, and you're going to affect generations to come. You will be a witness, and you're going to say, he is risen just as he said. And do you know what blows my mind? Is that she went back and told all the men. How many men came? Only two. Out of all the disciples, only two came to the empty grave. So we have been building, God has been building his kingdom of faith on women since that time. And we must continue it on. He has been building it on women whose hearts are going, you and you alone, God. I don't care what they say. You and you alone. And I'm going to just weep over your feet and go, I love you. I love you. I love you. And that's what changes the world. And that's our call. That's our call. So... That's enough. Thank you, God. Thank you for listening. See you all in two weeks.